here to talk with you a little bit about meal times. And I just wanted to start off with, can you think of a meal time that was really enjoyed by you? Just think about what that was and what that looked like and how that felt in terms of people that were there, etc. So what do you think of when you think of an enjoyable meal time? Okay. Give you two seconds, right? So what made that mealtime enjoyable for you? Maybe it was past celebration with family. What, what, was, what was it that was enjoyable? Somebody else made it. Somebody else made it. That's a good idea. What else made it enjoyable besides someone else making it? Which I agree with totally, by the way. Presentation. Presentation. So the way it looked on the plate. Okay. What else made it really enjoyable? Sorry? Conversation. Conversation, yeah, over there, absolutely, absolutely. And not rushed, okay. You guys, I don't have to prompt you. You guys are just caught food, okay. Anything else that made it really enjoyable for you? You could hear the people you were talking to. You could hear whom you're talking with, yeah. So you'd have to yell over folks. All right, anything else that made it really enjoyable? Not the same old, same old. So it had variety, something unique that you may not have made at home, for example. Okay. So some really good thoughts about what makes mealtimes enjoyable for you. And I'm, I'm understanding that everybody here is pretty much from long-term care. Is that correct? Right. And so if we think about then, in our long-term care context, what is that like? So I imagine, and maybe you want to raise your hands or not, I don't know, but is, is food one of the greatest complaints you have from residents and family? Yeah. After laundry? Okay. All right. And why do you think that might be? Why, why do you see complaints for food and mealtimes? Yeah. Go ahead. Because for some residents, those are the three times a day that they look for. Okay. I'm just going to repeat that for the people online, because I know the guy at the back just gave me a thumbs up on that. So the, the notion is some people never leave the room, and this might be the only time of day when they actually leave the room and socialize with other folks or get outside of that room space, since it's a key time for them. What else um, do you notice about long-term care in terms of the challenges you're seeing or the complaints that you might have from folks or anything you want to say about why this might be a little bit different scenario than what you just described? For me, yeah. Yeah, very little control over the experience in the mealtime environment. And there's lots of reasons for that, right? Lots of reasons why there's that lack of control. Certainly my husband thinks there's lack of control on his part when it comes to what I make, too. <laughs> but that's, you know, anyway, that's another story. Uh, yeah. Not liking your table mates. Not liking your table mates, yeah. And so we often have the choice of whom we get to sit with. Sometimes it's not always pleasant, like you're having an argument at dinner time at home, but hopefully it, most of the time it's pleasant. Although you might have to be cooking food and it might be kind of hard and stressful as well. Back to the point at the beginning. What else are some of, yeah? Foods you're accustomed to, like ethnic foods? So specific foods you might not be able to get in the home, right? Because of that lack of control, perhaps. Or maybe you do, which is great as well. All right. So, the challenge of long-term care, whether it be a small residence or retirement home, if we want to think extend that way, assisted living or an actual long-term care home, is of course we're moving into what we call a commensal situation, right? You're moving from living independently in the community to moving into a long-term care environment. And for many folks, that's very challenging, right? Uh, my mom actually just moved into a long-term care home just before Christmas, and she thinks it's like a cruise ship, quite frankly. She has no dementia, and she wins at bingo. And she thinks that's amazing that she wins at bingo. She's one of those ladies, though, like the lady in the front. Anybody else is cooking, it's a good thing. So she has very few complaints about the food, and of course, we're allowed to do some things that perhaps aren't allowed in other places, like bringing her own food in and having it available at breakfast, et cetera, and things like that. So everybody's experience is slightly different, but many people we see complaints and concerns about food and mealtimes because we're moving from this living alone, independent, lots of control, my choice, when I want to eat, where I want to eat, with whom I want to eat, to now not having that choice anymore, right? And how do we then hopefully try to bring that back in some shape or form? And I think personally that all the complaints we get about food is because of that. It's not because the food's actually bad. Maybe it could be hotter in some case, like the lady in the front said. But um, 
it often is because we're losing control and again playing about the things that we think we need to have control back over. We may not be able to control when we get a bath or that we need help with toileting or when we go to bed because we're so pain in, in so much pain etc. But food is one of those things right from birth until death we get to choose. We get to choose whether we put it in our mouth, whether we're going to chew it, whether we're going to swallow it. And so if we can figure out how to bring that choice back in to this three times a day, we might actually be able to enrich the quality of life of folks. So that's what I'm going to be hopefully talking with you about today. So I like to show this slide as sort of an evolution that I think we're all on. And you may be at different points on this evolution of moving towards this ideal that we talked about, where you get to choose with whom you want to eat. You've got hot food that you like, etc. cetera, um, from where you are now, right? Or where we were in the past. And I think we're all probably on this, this road towards improvement. Lots of people are interested in improving dining and improving meals because they know it is a big part of quality life for our residents and families. So at the top, we have physical space. A lot of people have been thinking about, do we change the physical, physical space to get rid of the institutional feel, right? How many of you got dining claws on the table at night now? Yeah. Or putting placemats down that give that personal feel, right? Um, thinking about reorganizing the space so it's smaller perhaps and less noisy and less institutional feeling. So a lot of us have realized that that's a key thing to do is think about the physical space because, because of course the physical space affects everything else in it. How many of you have a round table in your house? I do. I used to actually have a counter when I lived in a house, um, my husband's a Lutheran pastor, and we lived in a house that had a counter and then a very long table in the dining room, which we didn't eat at. But there was my child born, and my husband sat on one end, my child in the midi, middle, and me on the end. Well, guess what conversation is like? It's all to the child, right? And not around the counter. And so when we had the opportunity to move house, we actually decided to make sure we get a round table so that we could actually have the kind of conversation we wanted. This is just an anecdote to show you that the physical space truly does affect what happens at the meal, okay? And there is quite a bit of research to suggest that dining claws, dishes, for example, there's uh, good evidence to suggest that just changing the dish color can actually impact food intake. Decorations make it, of course, more um, home-like perhaps for folks. That's the physical space, and a lot of us are probably already on that journey or past that journey, right? You've got that down, but you still think there could be more to be done. Right? The next step that I seem to see happening both in practice and as well as what people are talking about in the literature is this idea of organizational space. We now are starting to think, to think about resident-centered care practices. So if we want dining to be home-like, I should be able to choose whom I get to sit with right? and when I come to the dining room. Right? That's organizational pieces. And a lot of us are starting to struggle with that, try to figure out how do we allow for flexible dining perhaps at breakfast, how do we start to think about uh, allowing people to sit where they want to or choose to sit with their family, for example, in the dining space while accommodating our other folks that are in that dining space, etc. That's what I call the organizational space that we're working on now. And a lot of people are working on that, flexible dining, etc. right? But my observation is that I'm not sure that's still enough. And where this comes from is, is actually quite a few years of experience watching dining rooms, seeing what happens, and specifically over an 18-month period, and Kate, who's in the back, helped out with this greatly, we watched one home move from more of a medical model to a social model of care, specifically in the dining space, and what that looked like, and how that happened, and what that did in terms of the relationships between resident staff and family or team members. So I've highlighted here open access. That's probably one thing that you might have struggled with or thinking about but not sure where to go. That to me is still organizational, as is meaningful activities, which is the idea of having residents involved and family involved in mealtime activities, like setting the table, for example, or cleaning up the dishes or things like that. Those have been shown as well, depending on where you look in the literature. Um, Europe does a lot of this, more of a household model. People live on farms, for example, and grow their own food. That's been shown to actually improve the quality of life, function, and cognition of people that are in those settings. So if we can get people involved in meaningful activities, it's important to them, right? But what I'm thinking is where we want to be is this last piece, and it's the way that care happens. And it's that soft skill around dining that we're trying to work on here within the RA and with a program called Choice, which we'll talk about at the end. This is the idea that meals are relational. It's eating with people that it feels like family, right? It's not strangers. It's the idea that we're caring as a family, the resident staff and family together. It's the idea of perhaps family-style dining, where family are allowed to be at the table. 
and we can share the food, etc. It might even include staff sitting and eating with the residents. And there are models of that that have been shown in literature to be more beneficial in terms of food intake and certainly quality of life for residents and family alike. So I think this is where we want to go. We're not there yet and we need to perhaps think about how we will get there. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So what is this idea of relational dining? It's this idea that social, psychological, nutritional needs are met. I think we're pretty good at working on nutritional needs and that takes a lot of our effort, I think, the, the nutritional needs of people in dining. But we've forgotten about the other side of dining. When you go home at night, having dinner with your family does something for you other than feed you in your body, right? It feeds you psychologically, it feeds you emotionally, right? And that's what people want. That's the promise of mealtimes they have learned throughout their lives and why they're missing it perhaps in the setting they're in now. And what the complaints perhaps and the dissatisfaction is about is this loss of the promise of mealtimes. Mealtime experience is a result of supportive relationships. That's what relational dining is. We coined this term, Kate and I, from looking at this one home move towards this and realized it was really about relationship. Right? When, if you think about residents in your long-term care scenario, it's hard to build relationship doing toileting or bathing. It seems a little bit more unnatural perhaps, but meals are a natural place for social interaction, right? So it's a natural place to build relationship. Care partners uh, meet the needs when they are highly attuned to the individuals constantly changing. I suspect if we could do relational dining, we wouldn't see the dyssynchrony that you sometimes see between a person who's just being assisted and the person who's assisting them in terms of speed, you know, overloading the spoon, challenges in terms of the person walking away because the person's not talking to them, etc. Of course, what this looks like will depend on the context and the needs of individual residents. In a retirement situation, it would be totally different from a long-term care situation. Retirement, relational dining, probably is more like a restaurant, a family restaurant you go to every Saturday where the staff know you by name, they know what you like, but they still treat you as someone outside of perhaps family. Whereas in long-term care, with a high level of dementia, it might be the staff member actually sits with you and eats with you because that's the only thing that's going to keep you at the table. It's more like a true family relationship. So this concept of relational dining is not consistent depending on setting, all right? It's going to range depending on where you're working. So assisted living, residential, retirement, and long-term care. So what is CHOICE? CHOICE is um, a pilot project that we actually created here at the RAA through years of research, my own research, looking at persons with living with dementia in the community and as they moved into long-term care. They said to us, meals are institutionalized. It's a system that we have to fit into. We just feel like another cog on the wheel or in that mealtime environment. So how do we pull back and think about making that individual true and individual in the dining space? And so working with Hillary and Kate and a variety of other people I've listed at the end who are, uh, were part of this process, we developed this choice program. The idea is to create mealtimes that feel like home, where personal preferences are honored and dignity and social interactions are supported. That's the goal. So what is it about choice? Choice is connecting, that's the first concept, and I'll unpack each of these pieces for you. It's about honoring dignity, offering support, identity, creating opportunities, and choice is about enjoyment. Where did this come from? I actually had the pleasure of interviewing families living with dementia in the community for six years. Every year, three interviews each, so uh, the care partner and the person with dementia together, and the care partner alone and the person with dementia on their own for six years. Huge amounts of data, hour-long interviews. Out of that came this idea that mealtimes are more than just food. It's about me feeling connected to those around me. And so my identity being honored. And so we've tried to bring these principles into this concept, as well as understanding what we saw with relational dining in that one home that moved towards a more social model of care. So let's unpack these pieces. Choice is about connecting. This idea that we develop relationships with residents and have conversation. It's great to have what I call food-related conversation, but it needs to go beyond that, quite frankly, other than asking, what do you want for lunch, right? It can be talking about what's outside, in the environment, etc. Many of the observations I've seen over, over time and, and anecdotally seeing folks, this is what they want, and we, we know this. We have residents asking us, what's it like outside, right? What's going on in my community? Because they want to know. Right? And mealtimes are a perfect time to be talking about those things. I went to the fair, I went to the market on the weekend, I bought this. Have you ever had apple butter, Marge? And talk about those things, right? And that's a way of building relationship. So connecting is taking time to be fully present, face-to-face, -face, making eye contact, acknowledging the individual and supporting participation. 
the challenges for persons with dementia specifically, this can be really challenging, right? So the person that might not have communication, verbal communication skills anymore, how do we connect with that person? And I'm sure we've all seen this for staff, it gets very easy to treat the person like a task rather than a person, right? So they don't make the eye contact, they may not even tell them what's on the spoon, may not even say to them, Marge, I've got mashed potatoes, meatloaf and corn. Marge doesn't say anything. Do I stop talking? No, because that's me, I talk anyway. But I, I would say, let's start with meatloaf. At least she knows what's coming, right? Can you imagine sitting in front of someone, having a food loaded up and brought to your mouth and you have no idea what's on the spoon? That doesn't treat you like a person, does it? Right? And that you have a choice. Honoring dignity. This is about residents' decisions. So it's decisions to stay in bed after 8 a.m. and not be in the dining room for breakfast, for example, or having routines and traditions. My mother wants apple butter at breakfast every morning. Every morning for the last 30 years, apple butter, whole wheat toast, oatmeal with brown sugar, and a yogurt. That's what she wants. That's her tradition, her routine. And if she gets that, she's happy, right? So we make sure she's got a good one kilogram jar of apple butter in the fridge, and they bring it out every morning for her, right? It's also about respecting residents' choices. So thinking about if you have an individual who wants to keep um, tight control of their diabetes, you figure out how to help that for that person. Or on the opposite side, someone who doesn't really care anymore about their diabetes and diet and really wants that chocolate cake, then figure out how you liberalize it and allow for that choice. We all make choices every day in the minute, including persons that have cognitive impairment, right? And when they don't get their choice, we know what happens. We see expressive behaviors happening as well. Treat and allow everyone to be an individual. This is the key. This is the challenge. I think in many parts of long-term care, we've gotten good at figuring out the individuality for bathing, et cetera, and how people like to be toileted or brushing their teeth, because it is a one-on-one -on -one activity. But mealtimes are still a very commensal activity, which means it's very hard then to think about how I treat each of you as an individual in that dining environment. And that's our challenge. Offering support is the idea of adapting and adjusting to the resident's needs and preferences. The idea that providing support based on what the resident needs that day. And so not jumping the gun and starting to assist when you don't need to assist or when people want to hold the glass and you can see them reaching for it, brushing their hand away and saying, no, no, I'll do that because you're going to spill it, right? Offering support in a way that's dignified that allows them to make that <coughs> choice and obviously uh, be safe but still knowing that day to day that's going to vary. Identity, accept and acknowledge residents for who they are, knowing the resident for who they are today as well, and understanding their life story. All the uh, staff in my mom's home know she was a teacher. I mean, she's, gonna, she's like me, she talks constantly. You imagine my daughter, how she talks, the three of us together, it's, mm -hmm. anyway. Um, so they all know that, but persons with dementia may not be able to communicate those things to you, and you need to know who they are. So my mom is doing certain things in that home because she was a nurse, or sorry, a, a teacher. Other people might do other things because they were a nurse. And allowing for that identity to come out, including in mealtimes. Maybe they want to now espouse a vegan alternative diet for themselves because they want to stay as healthy as they can to the last. That is their identity now, and you can't necessarily erode that. Uh, we need to support that. Finally, it's about creating opportunities, thinking outside the box. And so I'll just give you a little example here. If we want to stimulate conversation, how do we do that? For people, and I'll give you this example. I was, this, is, this is me here. Uh, I was at a dining space in a retirement, three ladies. They'd sat together for a year, and me, chatterbox that I am, sat down with them. One, I had to get the photo done, but two, I want lunch. Um, and started talking to them. And one lady across the way said, I never knew that about you, Lorraine, that you were a teacher and you traveled the world. They'd sat together for a year and didn't know these things about each other. So perhaps table tents, perhaps it's staff sitting down chatting about things, whatever it may be. But there's ways to create opportunities for the connection, for the idea of having activities. I'm sure we all have residents who want to be involved. Folding towels, setting the table, taking other residents to the room. We have to figure out how to do that because that's meaningful. Everybody wants a purpose, right? They've done research showing that even when you give a person a plant in long-term care, they have an extended length of life and better quality of life because they have a purpose. So we can figure out how to meal times, how to put purpose back in. That's going to be valued to the everyone, right? And then finally, choices about enjoyment. Meal times are not just about food. I'm sure you've all had food where you didn't necessarily like it, but you ate it and you ate it well because you were with company 
or it was a great atmosphere or whatever it was, right? And so I think all of us are working really hard to have really great food. Sometimes the complaints are about maybe the lack of other things that give enjoyment to the food, like who we get to sit with, having conversation, etc. So it needs to be thinking about beyond the food to that enjoyment. So when we think about food satisfaction, I'd rather see mealtime satisfaction because it's beyond the food. So we're doing a pilot right now in four neighborhoods um, using what we call waitlist control. So one neighborhood has started and the second one is, uh, second uh, um, village is actually on a list, waitlist control and be our control group for this. And we're measuring what we call relational dining behaviors um, with the team at baseline 8, 6, 24 and 32 weeks to determine sustainability of this intervention. We have created this uh, relational dining behavior checklist that came actually out of something called the M3 study. I don't know if people have heard about that. It's called Making the Most of Meal Times. And I'll just briefly speak about it because I think I probably have a minute to do that. Uh, I do have a minute to speak about that. So this study, some of you may have been involved uh, if you're one of the homes that was chosen. We had eight homes in Ontario. It's um, a huge data collection of 32 nursing homes in Canada, four provinces, New Brunswick, Ontario, Manitoba, and Alberta. And what we've done is basically weighed food intake for 20 residents in each home, so it's 639 people in Canada, weighed their food intake for three days, including the snacks between meals, we estimated those, and collected a huge amount of data on the site, on the province in terms of food cost, for example, on staff behaviors around care, as well as things like the mealtime environment. And this mealtime environment piece is what we've actually used in this pilot choice to understand are we seeing improvements because of the training that we've done. And so this innovation will take about 16 weeks, we think, to evolve. Um, it's a pilot, so we change things as we go a little bit, as you can imagine, with a pilot. But we're in the middle stages of it uh, and learning as we go. Key things is that we, first off, assess the dining space and the activities in it and feed that back to the home to say, these are some things we're noticing that maybe can be improved. And so just to give you an example of what was on this behavior scale, for example, um, we're looking for person-directed behaviors. Taking someone's apron and using it to wipe their mouth is not a dignified practice, right? That's a negative person care behavior. The opposite would be a positive care behavior where we use a napkin, right? So that's the way this scale was set up, positive and negative behaviors. And it was a list of these behaviors we'd seen, again, from observations we knew to be happening, as well as from the literature, as well as from that, um, that one home that moved through a social model of care. We did engage key management to talk about these issues and, and get buy-in about changing processes in the neighborhoods that were involved, included team education on the choice concepts as well as eating assistance because we knew that was a key area to also think about. And we've been working on huddle discussions every week focused in on these mealtime changes that we've got going on. We're right in the middle of that with the first, uh, first set of homes. And then we feedback progress to the, uh, to the homes in terms of saying how it's going based on the observation. So that's what the intervention looks like at this point. I imagine by the time it's done it'll look light, slightly differently than that. Of course that's what a pilot's about is trying to figure it out. But my top three recommendations for you for relational dining. First off, make sure you've got the organizational space right done and the physical space pieces as well as you can get those done because I think those are essential before you can think about relational dining. You have to have the ability of people make choice before you think about relational dining, okay? So flexibility and organizational issues are key. And think about work routines. How do we actually think about making, if we're going to actually make meal times flexible, which means I can come down for breakfast at 10 and I can come down for lunch at 2, how do we do that? Do we do that? And how do we get there? Start with the areas that your staff already consider to be important for improvement. And you probably know what they are. Is it the space? Is it the time of meals? Is it um, the physical space? You need to make some changes there. So target those things first. Think about that organization, physical, organizational, and then relational. And then finally, remember that education's not enough. It may be enough for you guys to start change, but I bet you, you guys will leave here, you've had a day of education, you've picked one thing home and actually start to implement it, that'd be great, right? Think about our staff now, 10 minutes of education, isn't going to change their behavior, right? We have to think more broadly about that. We have to think about the influences that change those vital behaviors and how we actually change them within that system. And so it takes a lot more work than just education. I think we're fooling ourselves. We think that's where we need to start and stop. So just a few thank yous. 
Hillary, as I said, was instrumental and is instrumental in being part of the intervention pilot that we're doing right now. She's delivering a lot of the content with Sarah Wu, who's my doctoral student. Sabrina and Vanessa are doing the data collection at the Meal Times. Virginia Miller and Jill Estokia were our um, support office folks here at um, Schlegel Villages that were helped in the development. Of course, Kate Duchek, who left the room. Huh, anyway, uh, <laughs> hugely instrumental in the development of choice, as well as Tiffany Gott, uh, a student who was involved last year. And finally, uh, Shuggle Villages, because we're doing the pilot in Shuggle Village and University Village Gates, because we actually practiced using those forms over the last uh, fall in University Gates, so it's greatly appreciated. So I'm welcome to take any questions if you've got them, and uh, we can have a bit of discussion as well. I'm just wondering if you've been having the challenges with families. Mm. Um, certainly, residence choice is great. Yep. And mom has just come from living with the daughter at home for the last yep. two years. And the daughter has been giving her flax bread and yep. bran and all this yep. kind of stuff. And then the resident comes in, they want white bread. Exactly. And they are very excited about that. Yep. So, yeah. and the family is having heart failure. And you become the arbiter in between, right? Yeah, yes. exactly, yeah. right, yeah. you know, and that. So I, I'm just I think kind of wondering if you've come across for, that yeah. as well. No, absolutely, absolutely. And so I think we need to do, um, an education job as well for family, right? And if I think about uh, food specifically, uh, I use the um, context of end of life. When we know that the person is dying, but the family is not ready for that, and they might be wanting to put in lots of interventions to support that, which end up being almost coercive, quite frankly, to the older adult. So it takes education uh, on our part, and, and maybe that's something to think about for our future education session with the RA, is how to negotiate family. And how do we do that? Maybe get a social worker, quite frankly, in here to help us out with some of that. Because it truly is that. It's getting that communication linkage between folks. I have a sister who happens to be a cardiac catheterization nurse. Can you imagine what she's like in long-term care? And then you got me. And my sister is funny. This is, again, just because, uh, and a little anecdote to share how interesting and get with families. My sister takes my mom to be um, going into her first home and the nursing staff automatically start talking to my sister rather than my mom because they just assume you know she's probably got dementia. It was not her home she's in now, the one she started. Um, and she calls me and says, Heather, what do I do? And I said, tell them to ask mom. That was it. And my sister needed that little bit of education that you know, you're not in control here anymore, mom is. And mom is, just because she happens to give up her house keys doesn't mean she doesn't have choice anymore. And so I've had to do that education with my own family as well. Um, and my mom, of course, being cognitive well really helps the matter. It's when you have the challenge with people with dementia, right? And how do you allow them to see that choice? And you know, I think observation, so education one and observation, showing them this is what it's like, you know, when mom's in the dining room, she wants white bread. This is her choice, right? And, and showing them the challenges around trying to get her to eat something else isn't helping her and helping her quality of life. And so it, it takes a bit of work, definitely, and maybe that's something for a change management thing to think about. How do we do that? It's definitely an issue with food, huge issue with food. Thank you. I was just wondering what your vision was for, like how far do you want to take this dining room? Do you picture that they will go in and just choose their seat every meal where they want, and they could choose from five different things? Yeah. And what do you do with, yeah. um, you don't call it responsive behavior, so yeah. I don't know what to say here. What do you do with people who yeah. might express themselves? Thank yeah. you. What I would see, what I would love to see, um, a ki a basically a short order kitchen by the small dining room that has 12 people seated around it and staff and family can sit around together and eat together. That short order cook that's in there has a selection already for the day but also can run down to the kitchen if need be to find the key things that Marge wants today, like a, a, an egg. That's what I see as ideal. So smaller, more flexible environments allow us to do that. We're not there. But that's what I see. Interim picture is figuring out how to get some of those key things we want on the neighborhood, in the dining area, to allow for that flexibility, knowing that we can't meet all the flexibility. So, for example, we know someone always likes this. Why can't it be in the ward or the unit or neighborhood fridge? Why can't it always be there? Why can't we have a staff member? Why is it we have to have a staff member? Um, dinner time is the least flexible, right? Why is that? <coughs> Because someone in the downstairs in the kitchen has to get home because we're not willing to pay overtime. Why not? So these are some of the questions I've got. Why can't we do that? Why can't we have the ability to have a runner that goes down to the kitchen and get things? I don't know. But there's some organizational issues that we can fix that are low-hanging fruit. There's others that are going to be harder to fix. Then we need more money. 
we need more labor, right? And we have to convince the government that those are worthwhile things. Mine's just a, a comment, actually. Um, one of the things that we've done to try to support families in the education of dining service mm -hmm. is when they have a complaint about what's happening, we actually yep. bring them in for a tour of the kitchen yep. and how food production happens within. We're not in long-term care. We're, I'm in from Alberta, right. and so Supportive Living Lodge. And so yes. how production works, how we make choices available, yes. um, and tour and 98% of the time, families understand that and have a different perspective of what it exactly. looks like. And that's the experience piece that was the point that being made that it's not just educating, let them experience it as well.